morning. It's almost lunchtime. That's awesome. Hey, I'm glad to be back. We were gone last weekend. My daughter uh, graduated from American University in D.C. It was a real college graduation. They even had a bagpipe band. They marched into a bag, like there was 700 of them from just her little school within the university, and uh, they marched into a bagpipe band, which is really cool for an Irishman. You know, and she also happens to be going to Scotland next year to do her master's, so it was totally appropriate. They did it just for her. <laughs> Favor ain't fair, as they say. But uh, no, we had a good time, but we missed being with you guys and uh, missed worshiping together. Man, what a special sense of God's presence this morning. And I heard last weekend was fun. It was Mother's Day. I didn't get the opportunity, but you know, you guys, ladies, you should have like two, three weeks of Mother's Days anyway. So happy Mother's Day, week two. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Yes, there we go. <laughs> it's a week late, but I got to uh, just say Happy Mother's Day. And, uh, but we're glad to be back. And uh, we're in week three of a little series uh, that we're doing where we're exploring, uh, that we're exploring kind of this idea of um, per, uh, one of our actually pursuits, but it's uh, neighborhoods to nations is what we've called it. And it's kind of us trying to better understand that God is on a mission, God is not somebody who's just, he's not distant, he doesn't sit up in heaven and kind of, he's put every, all the things in motion and just kind of goes for it. No, no, no. He has, he's on mission, he's on purpose, he's got a plan. And as we're discovering through this series, God wants you and I to be involved with him on that mission. And if you remember back on week one, we took a look at a couple of verses of scripture one found in Habakkuk 2.14 that says, As the waters cover the sea, so the glory or the awareness of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth. And, and we recognize that God was up to something, that he has a purpose and a plan. He wants his glory, his presence, his kingdom to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. He wants us to engage and encounter him here on planet earth. In fact, when Jesus showed up in Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, he shows up with an announcement. And it, it's the announcement of the gospel, and it wasn't an announcement of, "Hey, you all get a golden, you get a golden ticket, and you get a golden ticket, and you get to go to heaven." Right? Like, uh, that's not what Jesus announced. What Jesus announced in the announcement of the gospel was that the kingdom of God has come near. And so Jesus picks up on the same thing that, that the prophet Habakkuk, and if you go right the way back to Genesis, as we'll look at, take a little look at today, we recognize that God has been on mission. God has had a plan. And even though the enemy has tried to subvert and destroy the mission and the plan of God, God will have his way. How many of you read the end of the book? God wins, right? You know that. God wins the kingdom of earth. In fact, the kingdom of God will happen here on earth. In fact, I love that because this is what Jesus actually taught us to pray, didn't he? He says, I want you to pray this, that your kingdom, God's kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. And sometimes as followers of Jesus, you know, and, and sometimes there's kind of confusion around this. Sometimes we think that, oh, the mission is that he came to save me. And I know now because of Jesus, I'm going to end up getting into heaven somehow, some way. And so I'm going to hang on, try to work it all out. And uh, we'll get there someday. And so what if I was to tell you that that's wrong? What if I was to tell you that what the Bible actually teaches us is that it's actually about the kingdom of God coming here on earth as it is in heaven. In fact, I love this little quote that Aaron gave me this week from a guy by the name of Walter Rauschenbosch. I think that's how you pronounce his last name. That's a phenomenal last name. Rauschenbosch. I may change my last name to that. Rauschenbosch. That's good. Anyway, no, no, my wife says no. Okay, but, but he said this. He said, the kingdom of God is not a matter of getting individuals to heaven, but of transforming the life on earth into the harmony of heaven. In fact, one of my favorite authors is a guy by the name of John Ortberg, and he's written a little book called Eternity is in Session. And I love it because he's got this little quote in the book. It's almost at the start of the book, and he says this, God's not waiting for eternity to start. You know that, right? You know that God's not waiting for eternity to start. It's already started. It's been, it's been in his heart, and it comes out of who he is, that God has a mission. God has a plan. God has a purpose, and it's happening here on earth. And the, the, what we're discovering through this series is that God wants you and I to be a part of that mission. 
Uh, we, we say it this way, it's, it's one of our pursuits. We have four pursuits as a church family. They were kind of like values or pursuits or focus that we kind of tried to summarize. What is it we're all about? And one of them is that we pursue joining God's restorative work locally and globally by generously using all that God has given us. That's going to become important today. Generously using all that God has given us. We're going to explore that and unpack that today. Has given us for his glory that the glory of the Lord would fill the earth as the waters cover the sea, right? And the good of others so that people might be saved and live out this story that God has invited us to be a part of. And, and so what we're doing is that over the last week, this week, and next week, I'm trying to just kind of unpack a little bit uh, what, what does that look like for us as a church family? And the best way I can describe it is like a stool. And, and if, per, if neighborhoods to nations is kind of our umbrella, it's kind of where we're going, what we recognize is that there's three legs of the stool for us as a church family in terms of how do we do that? What's the focus for us in that? And, and Jeff did such a phenomenal job last week. I loved hearing the story of his mom. Uh, I thought his statement about how saved people are sent people who serve people. He's so brilliant. Don't we have a brilliant team of people? I'm sure he had some Hollywood writers that helped him with that. <laughs> I wish I could be as smart as Jeff. But I, I love what he was trying to communicate last week is that, that we are a people who are sent, that we're supposed to be those who reach out to others. And we do that locally. We do that in this region. We do that in this nation. We go to different parts. We're involved in lots of different, in fact, some of our partners were here last week. Some of you were involved quite regularly with some of our partners. And so we want to be the kind of church that's reaching out beyond the four walls of this building to serve and to love and to bring the message of reconciliation, the message of Christ to our neighbors, to our nation. But, but we also recognize that there's other legs of the stool that, that make up this idea of us pursuing neighborhoods to nations. And, and today I want to talk about missions and specifically what is God's plan for the nations because God actually wants you and I to be involved with the nations of the world. And then the last one is the church because the kingdom of God is established and extended through the local church. And we'll talk about that one next week. But today what I want to talk about is I want to talk a little bit about God's plan for the nations. Now, Jeff last week introduced us to a verse of scripture found in Acts 1 and verse 8. And it reads like this. It says, but you will receive power. So Jesus has told his disciples, I need you to gather in Jerusalem. Don't go out. I've got you on mission. I've got you called to do some things. You're going to partner with me, but I'm going to have you gather in Jerusalem. And then he gives them these words. He says, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And that ought to be an encouragement to us, and I hope you were encouraged, as Jeff talked about this verse last week, that, that you and I are not left to our own devices. We're not left to our own wisdom, our own strength, our own abilities. That God says, no, I'm going to empower you with my own spirit, the Holy Spirit, sometimes named the Spirit of Christ, right? The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. I'm going to empower you with the Holy Spirit to do something. Well, what is it? that he's going to empower us to do. I'm going to empower you to be my witnesses. In other words, you've seen the evidence. You've experienced the kingdom. You understand the blessing of God. You're a recipient of it. You're a witness to it. And so I'm calling you, I'm empowering you to be witnesses of the evidence of the kingdom, not just to Jerusalem, not just to Judea, not just to Samaria, and Jeff dealt with those last week, but I am empowering you to be witnesses of the evidence of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. And I, I feel pretty encouraged about that. Number one, I'm not doing this in my own strength. Number two, God's given me a mission. He's told me that I'm to be a witness. And he said, you get to go to the ends of the earth. So I want to unpack that a little bit today because God has a vision God has a mission, God has a plan for the nations of the world. In fact, when you get to the end of the book, in other words, when you go to Revelation, right? And uh, I know I've mentioned this to you. We're going to do a little bit of study in Revelation. Like, I'm not going to get into some of the weird stuff in Revelation this summer. Some of you are like, I can't wait to get into Revelation. I'm like, we're doing the first three chapters. That's the easy part, right? But, but 
In Revelation chapter 7, John, who's um, one of the disciples of Jesus, he's a prisoner on the island of Patmos, and he has this vision that God gives him of what things are going to be like when all, everything is as it's supposed to be at the very end of time. And the vision that John sees is a crowd of people. In fact, it says it this way, from every tongue or every tribe and every nation, every ethnos, every language, there's representatives from every single, rep or every single language and tribe, ethnos and nation on the earth. And they're all gathered together, worshiping and bringing glory to Jesus. And so God has a vision for the nations of the world. Now, so does Disney, so does Coca-Cola, so does the United Nations, right? So does the G20. Some of you are like, what's the G20? It's like 20 nations that kind of, and then the G7. I don't know how that all works, right? But in fact, I think the G7 just met this week. Like it's the seven, quote unquote, most powerful nations on the world and, or on the planet. And the, you know, all the presidents and leaders are getting together and trying to solve the problems. They're trying to kind of figure out how do we, what's our vision for the nations of the world? I mentioned Coca-Cola has a vision. How many of you remember, and this would have been in the 70s, so that might date some of us, you know, but how many of you remember, I'd like to buy the world a Coke? I don't know how the rest of it goes. There you go. We'll just hum the song, because we all know the song, right? They're, you guys are beautiful. We should form a choir. But, but 1971, an executive from Atlanta, Georgia, was flying to London to meet with some ad executives. They were going to work on some sort of new commercial for Coca-Cola that was going to go nation, or around the globe. And, and they had to land the plane. They couldn't land the plane in London because there was fog. And apparently in 1971, you couldn't land planes in fog. In fact, I think that's still the case with London. I don't know why. So what they had to do was they had to land at a little airport in Ireland called Shannon. Have any of you ever been to the Shannon Airport? No? Okay, so the Shannon Airport is on the southwest corner of Ireland. And when I first moved to America, like 30 odd years ago, you used to get on the plane in Dublin and it would take off. And about 15 minutes later, the 747 would land on this, in this little airport in Shannon, Ireland. They lit, and, and I'm not kidding you when I tell you this, they had to clear the sheep off the runway. <laughs> I'm serious. And so anyway, he lands in, you know, and the passengers are irritated and frustrated because they just want to get to London and they're only about 30, 45 minute flight away now. And, and, uh, but they got to be in this little tiny dumpy airport in Shannon with virtually no services and like, you know, there's hundreds of these passengers that have to hang out. And he, the, the, this, uh, Coca-Cola executive, he's like looking at all of these, these irritated passengers and they're getting annoyed at each other and frustrated and there's not enough food in the airport. And, and he noticed that there was one passenger who went and bought a couple of Cokes, bottles of Coke or whatever, out of a vending machine and he just started handing it out. And all of a sudden, those people started to kind of interact with each other. And it was out of that little incident, this has got nothing to do with the sermon, but you know, but it was out of that little incident that actually one of Coke's top ever advertising campaigns that you still sing some 40 years later, 50 years later at this point, right? That I want to buy the world Coke. Coke was trying to come up with a plan in the midst of all of the irritation and all of the brokenness. Buy somebody a Coke and it fixes everything. <laughs> now, you guys know there's a few things in life that I don't like that much. Cats and Disney. And in 1964, the World's Fair was taking place in New York City, and uh, they were celebrating, you know, kind of bringing all the nations of the world together, and that was kind of, that doesn't really happen that much anymore, the World's Fair, that is. Uh, but in 1964, the World's Fair was coming together, and to celebrate UNICEF, which is kind of the, uh, the arm of the United Nations that really takes care of children, um, Walt Disney uh, and his team came up with the most horrible ride that was ever created called It's a Small World. <laughs> and you know how it goes, don't you? You know the words, because I had to write them down, because I don't. 
It's a world of laughter, a world of tears. It's a world of hope and a world of fears. It's a, I can't read my writing. It's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. It's a small, well, okay, that's enough, that's enough. Some of you are gonna hate me this afternoon. You're gonna be like sitting at home, you know, just trying to watch the NBA finals, and it's gonna be, it's a small world. Uh. By the way, as an aside, you do know that at that, that song, and it's why it's stuck in your head so much, that song is the most played song in musical history. Did you know that? 1,200 times a day. That song is sung. That's why it's stuck in your head so much. Um, but the point is that Walt Disney, once again, was trying to do something to come up with his plan, his focus, his thought. In fact, it was so successful. There were some 10 million tickets, I believe it was, that were sold for the World's Fair that year to go on this ride that they moved it back to California and then they built one in Florida and they've got them in, I think, at about five different Disney worlds around the world now. All these years later, because the world, governments, entertainment, even a soda manufacturer are trying to have an answer to the question, what's the plan for this world that we live in? And the reality is that God, the God that created it all in the first place, he didn't just create it and not have a plan for it. God has a plan. And the plan is summarized in one word that when you see this word or when you hear this word, you're going to go, oh, I know that word. Or at least you're going to think that you know what that word means. And unfortunately, it's a word in our world, in our language, in, the, in American culture, that we've kind of cheapened it. It's kind of lost its meaning. And it's this little word, blessed. Bless. Now, they mocked me in first service because I did hashtag blessed, you know. And they all laughed at me. And, at least, and then somebody said I was old because I did that. And I thought, well, I didn't do pound blessed. <laughs> I'm trying to be cool here, you know? Hashtag blessed. I got a great parking spot at the Costco, you know, at Costco today, right? Favor ain't fair, right? Hashtag blessed. Like we've cheapened it to parking lots now, right? But that's not what God meant when he used the word blessed. And, and when you understand the word blessed throughout the thread of, of, of the Bible, what you recognize is that God actually, it's part of God's plan. It's, yeah, there you go. Thank you, Siri. Um, <clears throat> God has a plan for the nations of the world. And it involves this word, bless. Now, like I said, we've kind of cheapened what it means, but bless to to God and defined biblically, bless literally means flourishing, thriving, fruitful, full of life. It's this idea that, that God's intent for humanity was that there would, be a, there would be flourishing, that it would thrive, and he gives us life, and then he entrusts us to be dependent upon him, to be dependent upon his abundance, so that we can be life-giving not just to other people, but to the nations of the world. This is how big God's vision is, God's plan is, and the thing that God involves you in. You know, there's a little principle when you read Scripture, and you're trying to interpret Scripture. So the, the word is hermeneutics, when you're trying to kind of understand Scripture. One of the principles of hermeneutics is the law of first mention. And so when you see a word mentioned first in the Bible that there's a definition that's established right there that oftentimes that definition has to be read through the entire Bible. And so in Genesis chapter one, God uses the term blessed for the very first time. In fact, it's, it's found in Genesis chapter one, verse 27, and God said this, he said, so God created human beings. Who created human beings? So that means he has the authority. That means that he has the design, he has the plan, he, he knows what's best, he's created the blueprint, right? So God created human, or human beings in his own image. And then he says it again, he says, in the image of God, he created them. Now when God says something twice, and some of you parents have had to repeat some things to kids a lot more than twice, right? But when God repeats something, I think we ought to pay attention. 
And so he's saying, you're created in God's image. In his image, you're created. I really want you to understand something here. You're created in the image of God, that God has a design for you. God has a purpose for you. God has a plan for you. God has a mission for you in his story. And he goes on and he says this. He says, God created them. And then look at this, male and female, he created them. God's a God of order. God's a God of design. And then he goes on and he says that then God, look at this, blessed them. Like the first thing that God does is not give them a set of instructions, a set of rules. He doesn't give them a kind of here's a what for. You better do this. No, no, no. What does God do? He says, I'm blessing you. And as a result of the blessing, he goes on and he says, now be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. And, and what, or what God is trying to help us understand here is that God's mission, God's plan is to bless, is to give you his life, to have you flourish and grow and blossom and be fruitful. Now, there's a little, uh, there's a little term in, that we use, oftentimes used in medical, called failure to thrive. And, and, and oftentimes used of infants who, who are failing to thrive. In other words, there's a, a deceleration or, or uh, there's a um, kind of a slowing down of their ability to grow or to thrive. And, and what God is trying to help us understand is, no, 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 I, God doesn't bless us and say, hey, try to do it on your own strength and that'll all end up in failure to thrive. What God says, no, I'm blessing you. I'm giving you my life. You can depend upon me, depend upon my abundance towards you. This is God's plan. This is what God's up to for you and for I, but also for the nations of the world. And so what we discover is that God, his first words to humanity found in Genesis chapter 1, 27 through 28, were what? I'm going to bless you. I want to bless you. And I'm not blessing you just for the sake of you being blessed. I'm blessing you. And here's what I want you to do now. I want you to go bless others. I want you to be fruitful and multiply. Now, rather than filling the earth with life and fruitfulness... Right? Rather than multiplying all of that stuff, what we, it, it kind of goes downhill pretty quickly. In fact, in Genesis chapter 6 through 11, what we discover, rather than fill the earth with goodness, rather than fill the earth with life, rather than blessing, the Bible actually tells us that, they, that humanity filled the earth with violence, with greed, with power, consuming selfishness. And so we're, rather than, than humanity who has been blessed by God, received his blessing, received his life, and rather than turn around and bless others with that, they consumed it for themselves and they filled the earth with violence. Now, you probably know your biblical history because what happens next is that God picks a guy by the name of Abe or Abram. I just shortened his name. You know, I think him and God were kind of on short terms or easy terms with each other. But he picks a guy by the name of Abram and he changes his name to Abraham. And, and you know what he says to Abraham in Genesis 12, one through three? He says this. He says, I will bless you and I want you to be a blessing now to others. And do you see the thread here? Do you see what's going on? That even though humanity turned its back on God's mission, God's plan, God's design, even though humanity filled the earth with violence, God says, I'm not giving up on my mission. I'm not giving up on my purpose. And I'm not giving up on involving you in it. He says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your family. In fact, I'm going to make a great nation, a great ethnos out of you. And that that nation or that ethnos is supposed to be a blessing to all the other nations of the earth. Because of your relationship with, G or with God, because of your dependence upon me, because of your trust in me and my abundance towards you, you are designed to be a blessing to other people, to other nations. Now, we, so what, what you, and you see this take place 
That nation comes out of the family of Abram, and that nation is a nation called Israel. Now think in terms of ethnos, think in terms of Hebrew people, Old Testament, okay? And this nation, and you see this through the prophets, you see this through the Old Testament, you see this in the writings and the Psalms of David, then the covenants that God makes throughout the Old Testament with the leaders of the nation of Israel. And over and over and over again, he repeats to them the same mission and the same mandate that he gave to Abram, that he gave to, the, um, that he gave to humanity at the very outset. He said, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing. But what we discover throughout the Old Testament, go read the Old Testament. They're consumed with sin. They're consumed with selfishness. They continue the cycle of, uh, of, and the pattern of violence and greed and power struggle. And rather than being a blessing, they become kind of this thorn in the flesh. And, and, and so we recognize that God is consistent in his mission. His mission is I'm going to have a people on this planet that I'm going to bless and they will be a blessing to others. But they kept failing. And you can read it throughout the Old Testament. Generation after generation after generation, they failed to engage with God in the mission that God had for them. God would bless them, but they take that blessing and consume it for themselves rather than being a blessing to others. And ultimately, what we discover is that, that ultimately the blessing of the Lord, the mission of God, couldn't be accomplished through sinful humanity. It would have to be accomplished through a human being who lived without sin. And so ultimately, we know the story of the Bible. Jesus, our God's own son, gets sent. There's this word that if you've been around church, it's Messiah. Literally means king, King Jesus, the anointed one. And here's what we discover. In fact, if you want to, and I'd encourage you to go read this passage of scripture for yourself, the whole psalm talks about this, but I'm going to look at just verse 17 of Psalm 72. And this is what it says. May the king's name, who's the king? It's Jesus. This is who David is talking about in this psalm. It's a prophetic psalm that is talking about King Jesus who's coming. And it says this, may the king's name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun shines. May all nations, look at this, be blessed through him, and bring him praise. The mission started here. God said, I'm going to bless you. Be fruitful and multiply. Now we're going to fill the earth with violence and greed because of sin, because we want our own will to be done. You know what? I'm going to pick a man named Abraham and his family. Nothing redemptive about him. He's a pagan man. There's nothing like kind of good about this guy. He just says, no, I'm going to bless you and make you a blessing. And through Abraham, there would be, the, the nation of Israel would come, I'm gonna bless you so that you can be a blessing. But once again, they failed. But you see the pattern continues. God says, I'm gonna bless my son, the Messiah, and in him, all the nations will be blessed. God's mission continues. God has a plan. And that plan is that, th that through the Messiah, through Jesus Christ, and by extension, you and I as members of his body, members of his family, the bride of Christ, we are how God accomplishes his mission. God has blessed you to be a blessing. And, and the early church understood this so clearly they understood that because of their relationship with Jesus, because they were in Christ, you've heard me talk about this many, many times, you know, some 216 times in the New Testament, you're in Christ, you're in him, you're in the beloved. Because you are in the Messiah, because you are in Christ, you are blessed. You have the life of Jesus. You have the fruitfulness, the flourishing, the dependence upon the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And because you are in Christ, you are a part of being a blessing to all nations. 
And this is exactly what we see happening in the early church. The early church, they received this new life in Christ. They understood that they were in Christ and that they understood that they were representatives, ambassadors. They were an extension of the mission that was started through Jesus Christ. And that they were to live in a particular way. And this is exactly what we see in the life amongst them. We see that they were generous, not just to family, not just to those who, that, they, that they knew, but they were generous to strangers, to widows, to orphans, to the marginalized, to the sick. We, we discover that they had a different sexual ethic. They lived in a countercultural way. So where, where married men, it was okay for them to have sex with prostitutes and slaves and even children, and nobody batted an eye. They said, this is wrong because we don't take advantage of people. No, no, we live out a different sexual ethic. We recognize that they rescued unwanted babies that had been simply thrown out because they were about giving life, not taking life. They were a multi-ethnic community since their common identity was in Christ. And so it's, it's, the, it's one of the only places that we see in that ancient culture, the Romans and the Jews, everybody was, um, was uh, divided into their segments, but it's the early church that was multi-ethnic. It was the early church that started to represent people from every tribe and every tongue that were beginning to be gathered together because their identity wasn't primarily in their ethnos. Their identity was primarily in Christ. They believed in non-retaliation. They believed in forgiving their enemies, even those who were killing them. In fact, there's a, there's a, a governor in the Roman Empire but called Pliny the Younger. What a great name, Pliny the Younger. I assume there was Pliny the Older as well. Maybe Pliny the Middle Child. He felt like he was left out. I don't know. But anyway, Pliny the Younger, he actually wrote a letter to Governor uh, Tar, uh, Tri, Trijan, Tri, not Tarzan, Trijan. Anyway, um, and he wrote this letter to the Caesar, to the emperor, and he says, I don't know what to do with all these Christians because I know I'm supposed to persecute them because they're not willing to worship you, Caesar. They're only willing to worship King Jesus, but they are generous. They take care of the poor and the marginalized. They, they're willing to stay and take care of the sick. They're living as ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And he couldn't find fault. What was he supposed to do? They understood, the early church understood, I have been blessed to be a blessing. And this is what Paul picked up on in 2 Corinthians. And I probably don't have time to go through the whole passage. But if you go read 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 20, what you realize, it says that Christ's love, that, that's what controls us now. We talked about that in week one. It's Christ's love that compels us to do what we're supposed to do. We no longer look at people through a human lens. We look at people through the lens of Jesus. We look at those who are, who are lost and needing to be rescued. We look at them a different way. He goes on and he says, so we've stopped evaluating from a human point of view. Down in verse 19, he says, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. In other words, what Paul understood was, I am now an ambassador of the King of kings and the Lord of lords to the kingdom, kingdoms of this earth. And, and as an ambassador, I have been entrusted with a message of reconciliation. A message, not just that we're reconciled to one another in Christ. No, 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 we're reconciled to our creator, God, through Jesus Christ. He involves us in the story. He involves us in his mission. And he rounds it out in verse 20 by saying this. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. And I guess my question for us this morning is, what does it mean? Do you see yourself as an ambassador of Christ? Do you see yourself as a part of his mission, his purpose, his plan here on earth? Or is it just you hanging on, trying to make it to the other side? Hopefully I'll get into heaven if I'm good enough. By the way, the answer to that question is none of us are good enough. And it's because of the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. Not only are we rescued and have right relationship with Jesus, but Jesus invites us into his mission, into his story. And so what does it mean to be invited into that story? What does it mean for us as ambassadors to be sent? Because that's really what, what Jesus was 
trying to communicate, I think, to his disciples in Luke chapter 10. In fact, it, it, it says this way, and I, I just want to rattle through it really quick, but it says in Luke chapter 10, verse 1, it says, after this, the Lord Jesus appointed 70 others, and he sent them out two by two ahead of him. Look at this, to every town and place where he was about to go. I'd never seen that before. It had never struck me before that, that God or Jesus, in gathering these 70 disciples and sending them out, he wasn't just sending them out randomly. He was sending them out to the places where he was about to go. That sounds like he's involving these 70, and by extension, you and I, into his mission, into his purpose, and into his plan. And, and it's not just a random, oh, I'll just go randomly. No, no, no. God, and this is what I love, we, we've, we punch above our weight. In fact, I think we had five or six mission trips went out last year and again this year. Like, not to like Southern California, by the way, okay? That's a vacation, okay? That's not a mission trip. Like, we've got people going to Kenya and Cambodia and Jordan. We just had a team come back from Puerto Rico. Like, like we're, people are sacrificing time, sacrificing money, sacrificing vacation time Because they understand that they are called, they are sent, God has an assignment that God wants to do something in Cambodia. He wants to do something in Jordan. He wants to do something in Kenya. He just did something in Puerto Rico and he's sending you and I out to go be a part of his plan. He goes on and he says this, these these were the, the instructions that he gave them. He said that the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So complain about it. Tell somebody else that they should go. No, that's not what it says. He said, so pray to the Lord of the harvest who's in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into the fields. Now, the problem with praying that prayer is that Jesus might just turn around and say, I'm sending you. I want you to go. I don't have the money. I don't have the time. I couldn't do it. What would I do? Well, remember where we started, Acts 1.8. I will empower you through the Holy Spirit. And what then we discover next, he says in verse 3, I'm sending you uh, out like lambs among wolves. Oh, God, Jesus, that's awesome. Thank you. Because the last thing I read, wolves like to eat lambs. But have you felt that? Like, have you felt the fact that if you were a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, it feels like it's pretty rough out there, isn't it? It's pretty safe in here. We're all amongst friends and family, and for the most part, we all agree, and we all kind of put a mask on and tell everybody we're doing great every week. No, not really. But, but out there, man, it's hard. Yeah, it's like, it's like lambs amongst wolves. But remember, remember this. I'm empowering you with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to give you wisdom and counsel, and you're going to know what to do. And, and then he goes on and he says this, do, I love this, do not take a purse or a bag or sandals, I take at least three pairs of shoes even when I went to D.C. for three days, but I don't want you to take any extra sandals, don't take your bag, don't take your purse, don't greet anyone on the road. What, what, is, what is it that Jesus is trying to communicate about sentness in this verse? What he's trying to say is that, that we live, we take a countercultural message of reconciliation, reconcile back to God, reconcile to one another. We take that message into a world that's, quite frankly, not interested in it. In fact, has an enemy that's fighting against it. And then what he's saying is, now be dependent upon me. Now, I've been here a pretty short period of time. It's almost two years. And the number of stories I have heard from you, people that were going on a missions trip, and I don't know how I'm going to pay for it, and I'm short, and all of a sudden, something happens. Somebody makes a donation. I just felt compelled that somebody gave. That's the Lord saying, I told you to be dependent upon me. Look, I've taken care of it for you. And this is where Jesus wants us to live. He wants us to live out of dependence upon him. He goes on and he says, now when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. That sounds awfully like blessing to me. I've blessed you so that you will be a blessing. He says, stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you. Now some of you have been on a missions trip and there's been some food placed in front of you And inside, you thought to yourself, "Mm, I don't think so. (laughs) Can't we just get a burger? Like, I'll eat McDonald's at this point, right? 
But, but what Jesus is trying to help us understand here is that he says, look, when you go, you're going to be a blessing and you're going to build relationship. Anytime you see eating and drinking in the New Testament, by the way, Jesus, 94 times it's recorded that he was eating and drinking with sinners and all kinds of people that the oh, society didn't, you know, when he called his disciples with his disciples, as he left his disciples, he was eating and drinking. Anytime you see eating and drinking, it's always the table is to bring people together for the sake of relationship. And, and so what Jesus is saying here, he says, I want you to go with the cultural message. I want you to be dependent upon me. I'm the one that's going to provide for you. And I want you to go be a blessing. Go build relationship. But this is the last thing then that he says in verse 9 of chapter 10 of Luke. He says, heal the sick or heal the sick who are there and then tell them this. And guess what he wants you to tell them? The kingdom of God has come near to you. There's evidence of the kingdom. Now, where did we start a couple of weeks ago? What is God's plan? What is God's mission? God's mission is that the kingdom of God would come here, as it is, here on earth as it is in heaven. And, and Jesus says to his disciples, hey, listen, I want you to pray that prayer. Pray that the kingdom of God would come here on earth as it is in heaven. But then he sends out the 70. And he says, I want you to go and I want you to be a blessing. I want you to build relationship. And then I want you to tell them the kingdom of God's come near. There's evidence of the kingdom of God here on earth. Isn't that what Jesus came to announce? Mark 1, verse 15. It's interesting, at the end of his life, or at the end of John the Baptist's life, John the Baptist goes, are you really the Messiah? And, and he's in prison, right? He's about to be beheaded, and he goes, are you really the Messiah? Now, John the Baptist, if anybody knew that he was the Messiah, it was John the Baptist. Remember when he was in Elizabeth's womb, and Mary comes and announces, and, he, and there's this leaping in, in Elizabeth's womb. Like, even before he was born, there was an interaction. There was a, it's the Messiah, when Jesus approaches him, he says, behold the Messiah, king of the world. And he says, I'm not worthy to baptize him. He knew who the Messiah was, but he's about to be beheaded. And he sends some of his disciples to say, Jesus, Paul, oh, Jesus, are you really the Messiah? And you know what? You know how Jesus responds to him? Jesus doesn't respond by going, yes, I'm the Messiah. Jesus says, the lame walk. The blind see, the deaf hear. Jesus responds, there's evidence of the kingdom on earth. And, and so when you and I, when kids are rescued from sex trafficking and, and gain an education, when they hear and respond to the gospel, when they learn meaningful skills like coaching soccer in Cambodia, it's evidence of the kingdom that some of the most vulnerable in our society are being rescued and encountering Jesus and being given hope for the future. And I believe through Jeff and Jenny uh, and others who are there and teams that will go out of this church that there's a nation that will be turned around because there's evidence of the kingdom. When refugees from war-torn Muslim countries can be loved, fed, medical issues taken care of, welcomed into Christian community and begin to understand that God has arrived amongst them with good news, like what's happening with our partners in Amman, Jordan, Syrian refugees who are being loved, Muslims being loved and cared for and, 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 and shared the gospel with. That's evidence of the kingdom. And it's evidence of the kingdom that our church gets to be a part of. When vulnerable children living on the streets are cared for and through relationships experience the gospel and are discipled, families are encouraged, equipped, training provided for kids so that they can be reintegrated into families. That's evidence of the kingdom, like the kind of work that's taking place through Agape in Kenya. One of our partners and a team will go out there later this year. It's evidence of the kingdom. When families whose homes have been severely damaged uh, and, and are served by strangers from another nation who would be willing to sacrifice time, money, and vacation to go to Puerto Rico and help repair and restore some of those homes, that's evidence of the kingdom. And it's evidence of the fact that God's mission involves you and I. That you and I have been called to be 
not just blessed, but to be a blessing to others. And so this is what God's invited us into. God's invited us to partner with him, to join with him in his restorative work, not just to pray prayers, although for all of us, I hope this is the case, that we would be willing to say, Lord, I might not be able to go, but I'm willing to pray. I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to have you burden me with a particular nation or a particular people group. Lord, I'm willing to read and to understand and to begin to stand in the gap. Oh God, what would my prayers do for something or someone halfway around the world? Well, that's why the Bible describes, Jesus described the kingdom of God like a little mustard seed or a little piece of yeast, that that little piece of yeast, when it gets in and it spreads, it has tremendous impact. So don't underestimate your prayers. That's part of being sent. For some, it might mean, man, I can give. And, and we're a church that believes in tithes and offerings, that, that the Lord would, would, has blessed us to be a blessing so that the work of God could continue. Last year, this church gave away 12% of what was con- contributed outside of the walls. Because we're committed not just to praying, we're committed to giving. But we're also a church that's committed to going. And for some of us, I hope I have the privilege to spend 15, 20, 25 years with you and that I get to watch maybe some of your children, maybe some of you, that not just I'm going to go on a missions trip, maybe there's still room for Jordan, there's still room for Kenya later this year, that's a little advertising right there, but maybe some of you, God's going to put his finger on your heart and say, I'm going to send you to the nations of the world. That I'm willing, you're willing, that we as a church are committed to supporting and doing whatever we can to equip and to train so that we can join God in his mission. God has blessed you and I to be a blessing, to join with him in his plan for the nations. And so here's what I want us to do. I just want us, maybe in response, that if you're, no music, no keys, no hype, no lights, just you and Jesus. If you want to close your eyes right now, that'd be cool. But I think we have to answer the question, man, do I want to join God in his mission? Or do I just want to live in the blessing that he's given me? And I want to challenge you, I want to encourage you that you and I are blessed. Remember, blessing is not circumstantial. You can be blessed even in the midst of suffering because of the life and the relationship and the flourishing that you have. And maybe for some today, it's a step out of, I was talking to one lady in between services and she just said, today was a transition for me. I'm stepping out of just receiving blessing. I'm going to be a blessing. I'm going to be willing to join God in his mission by praying, by perhaps giving, maybe even going to the nations of the world. And if that's you this morning, it starts with a step. And I think what I just want to ask this morning is, would you be bold and willing enough just to stand to your feet, join me, I'm standing, and say, Lord, I'm willing to join you in mission. I don't know what it means, but I'm at least willing to take a step. I'm willing to try to be a blessing, not just receive the blessing this morning. And so if that's you, would you be willing just to stand to your feet? And then I just want us to pray together as we close. So Jesus, you see our heart. Lord, we are a family Your word makes it really clear that we are the body, the family, the bride of your son, Jesus. And Lord Jesus, we recognize from Psalm 72 that it's in you that all the nations of the world are blessed. And Lord, because we are in you, because we are your children, because we are your family, your bride, Lord Jesus, we are also, as Paul said, ambassadors of that kingdom. And Lord, we trace the whole way through, history, through biblical history from creation to Abraham throughout the whole Old Testament right through the New Testament church 
to this picture of nations and tribes and tongues gathered before the throne. And Lord, you are inviting us into, into that story, into that mission, into that purpose. So Lord, this morning, you see our hearts. We just respond. Lord, we just say, would you just speak to us? Would you lead us? Would you guide us as a church family, but also as individuals? Lord, just responding to your mission, to your call, to be those who would give life, to be a blessing to other people. Lord, for some of us, it's our friends and our neighbors and our family and locally, but Father, for some, it might mean going. And Lord, we just commit ourselves to that end. In Jesus' precious name, come on. And everybody said, amen.